Hello. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing very, very good. How are you? I'm great. Uh, it has been a busy but relaxing week, which I have enjoyed. What about you? Yeah, same. I feel like trying to hit summer rhythms, but I'll tell you, Oregon has been having the wettest April, May, and half of June, as we record today, in the last 81 years. So it has just wow. been... Yes, it's just miserably gross. I am recording with you on a Tuesday evening in the middle of June, and I have a jacket on, and I actually kind of wish I had gloves on. It's cold, and I'm ready for summer. Wow. Oh, my goodness. It is the exact opposite here. It has been painfully hot. It has been easily over 100 degrees the last couple of days. I went running this morning, and it was muggy, and I mean, I think it was 6.30 in the morning, and it was 80-some-odd degrees. It has been hot. Yuck. That sounds miserable. Yeah. No, I, I did it just to have done it, not because I thought I was going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, which is a good segue to doing Bible and prayer reading, because I think sometimes... Yeah, because you should always do that not to enjoy it. <laughs> I think you should do it in spite of whether or not you're going to enjoy it. Yes, good point. That's the relational thing we were talking about last week. But yeah, so I, I know I ended our last conversation with this, but I wanted to come back to this idea. You used two great words to describe our conversation about spending time with God, and they were the, the words method and rhythm. And last week, we talked a ton about different methods that we both use, and I just wanted to dig into this idea of a rhythm and find out from you what kind of rhythms does your spending time with God have? What did you mean by that when you first used that word and why was it important to you? Oh man, that's such a great question because this is so incredibly current for me. As you know, I spent years on night shift and Night shifters are uh, a little foggy brained anyway, but especially when it comes to rhythm, there's no way we could even spell the word rhythm. There is no rhythm in life. I actually can't spell the word rhythm for the life of me. <laughs> I have to look it up every single time. So I'm with you. Go on. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy word. So I'll give you credit. But the point being for me, the, the fact that I would have four days a week where I'd sleep during the day and be awake at night, and then kind of a day of transition where I either didn't sleep or slept very little, and then I'd be awake for a couple of days during the day and try to sleep at night if my body would let me, and then I'd re reverse the whole process and on we go. And so, hmm. I, so often I have been taught – well, just get up early and, and have your morning time with God. And that is, uh, it's just going to be your, your protected time. And I think to myself, what, what is early and on what day are you talking about? So <laughs> having a rhythm is something I've dreamt about for years. And just a couple months ago, I moved to day shift largely, uh, it was a hard decision. I actually really like the night shift life at work. I know I complain about it a lot on the podcast, but I think I'm just trying to explain the toll and the impact that it has. What I've failed to yes, do- Yes, I will validate the fact that you have often said to me that you really like the, the kind of vibe and culture of the work in the evening, at nights. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. So it was actually a hard decision for me to move to day shift. But the thing that I really was seeking by moving to day shift- was having these rhythms and being able to establish some consistency in lots of areas of life, but particularly in my relationship with God. I really wanted to cultivate this quiet, contemplative prayer life where I, in, I had this uninterrupted time to connect with God. And mm. I, I haven't, I mean, I've, I've had mixed results since going to day shift. I have not developed, I have not perfected the disciplines required to make that a daily habit. 
but I have had fits and starts and some successes in developing those rhythms. So this is very, very current for me. Rhythm is a word that is on my mind. And when I say rhythm, I, I think what I really mean is a consistent, quiet, contemplative time with God that I can look forward mm. to and build into my spiritual practices. That's what I'm talking about with rhythm. Hmm. That's so good. You know, and you used this great phrase that I appreciate. You said, I haven't yet perfected the discipline. And I appreciate the fact that even the way you're saying that recognizes that developing a new discipline or habit is a time-consuming process. Not yeah. in the sense that you have to spend hours today on it, but in the sense that you have to fail lots of ways before you can do it well consistently. Does that make sense? I'm living it. It makes perfect sense. You know, we we talked in, in a previous episode about my rules of life. And one of my rules of life is anything worth doing well is worth doing badly first. And I, I for me... I often am ashamed of failing in such a way that I am liable to give up rather than to press through the failure. I, I just loved the way you said that because it was, you know, I haven't perfected this discipline yet, but I'm working on it. Yeah, honestly, you have shared that rule of life with me so many times. It has seeped into my mind, my heart, and it helps me put in perspective the fact that I'm not there yet. The fact that I've only been working on this particular discipline for the last couple of months. And even though parts of me want to condemn myself for not having it all down, other parts of me listen to the advice that you just gave. And I really appreciate that. Hmm. Well, you know, let me ask you this then. If you're going to agree with my basic rule there, I want to know what are the things that have messed you up? I have my own list of these, but... What are the things that have interrupted that rhythm? What are the things that have fouled you up as you've been trying to build that rhythm? What's gotten in the way? What's gone wrong? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. So there's work days and there's non-work days. These are different rhythms, and I assume that's true for all people in the working world. And on work days, I start my shift at 5 a.m., Sometimes, if there's coverage issues, sometimes I start at 2 a.m., so I don't know how much day shift that really is. But at any rate, I rely on taking a break in the morning so that I can pull up the Forward Day-by-Day -day app and pray through the Book of Common Prayer. That's something I want to be part of my daily rhythm, whether I am at work or not at work. And my time that I've carved out for that on work days is during my morning break. Well, we work at 911. Like <laughs> you can't guarantee that your break is going to happen at a certain time or that emergencies aren't even going to push that break beyond your ability to take it. And, you know, I know if any bosses happen to listen to this, they don't want to hear that sometimes I don't take my breaks, but the reality is sometimes I don't take my breaks. And when I don't take my breaks, I don't get my prayer time. And that's mm. a barrier. I need to, I've recently thought to myself, okay, I need to have a conversation with my pod partner, the person that I work with directly, and just say, if things allow, I want my morning break to be at this time. And we're going to plan life as though that's going to work and know that sometimes it might not work. I think if I have that conversation, I'm, I'm going to be more consistent. But then on my non-work days, boy, it's a variety of things. I haven't really pinned it down. Sometimes, some. I think most of the time, I'm just not getting up in time. I think that's what it is. I, I start translating with my friend on two of my weekend days early in the morning at 6 a.m., but I could easily be up and had planned to be up by 5 a.m. to start my prayer time. And I've not been getting up on time. That's been my hangup. I need to get up on time mm. so that I can have that quiet time with God. So 
those are the two things that I'm two reasons why I tend to fail at this so far. Mm -hmm, That's good. Yeah. I would throw in, so I'm, I'm pretty good at getting up on time. I would say my two biggest challenges in genuinely spending time with God are number one, there is something that is too forcefully on my mind for me to stay in a place where I feel like I'm connecting with God. Mm. I'm stressed about something. I'm anxious about something. I'm angry about something. I'm confused about something. I'm whatever. And, you know, I can hear the simple greeting card level Christian advice that says, well, then you should just pray about that. Yeah, I know. And that's like three seconds. And then I'm still thinking about it. And (laughs) it's not in a prayerful way in any way, shape or form. I'm just trying to figure out what to do. And so when my mind gets spinning, that can be tough for me. And then uh, the other thing that can be tough, particularly because I often am using my phone in my time with God, is that I'll get up, I brush my teeth, I go over to where I'm going to pray, and then I want to take two or three minutes and wake up, and I often will scroll through something, the news, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, to like, just give me a a chance to wake up. And this is a horrible plan because I get sucked in sometimes. And I find myself having to guard my inputs before I spend time with God, because that just messes me up so much. Yeah. I have to admit that sometimes what I encounter as well, even if I wake up on time, sometimes I'll lay in bed and want to wake up a little bit and I'll start scrolling and pretty soon it's time to translate and I'm off to my day and I never get back to it. Even though I tell myself I'm going to get back to it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that is true for me as well. When I first started pastoring, I often would tell people, just find a time that works for you. And I still think that. But over the years and listening to people's experience, the wisdom of the generation before us that said, you know what, just do it first. I'm beginning to respect that wisdom. Because the number of times people, you know what, I'll do it first thing when I get home. I'll do it first thing when the kids go to bed. I'll do it right, What you know, and so often, at least for me personally, those things have all failed. Ultimately, if I don't do it first, uh, like you just said, it doesn't get done. Yeah, you're exactly right. Kind of humbling to accept the wisdom of past generations. Yeah, right? Because, I mean, the generation of Christians before us just said, get up and read your Bible first thing, right? I mean, there were no options. (laughs) It may be that they knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, using the Pray As You Go app, my rhythm for doing that is as I drive to work. But I also love to listen to audiobooks, and so I really look forward to that part of my drive as well. So I, again, have had to learn the lesson that if I don't start my drive with the Pray As You Go app, then I don't get back to it again, because I want to listen to those audiobooks or I want to get onto other parts of my day. So I have to start even there first thing with the Bible stuff. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's got to be first or it doesn't get done again. And, and to be clear, not in some legalistic fashion, like I'm not aiming to spend a hundred out of the next hundred days starting off with Jesus. I am fully aware that weird, random interruptions are going to happen. My dog is going to be puking all over the carpet, or my wife found a stray cat outside the other day that was like not well, and that kind of thing happens, or whatever. You know, weird things happen no matter what you're going to do. And that's all okay. Uh, I think for me, it's just aiming to get the best possible results I can knowing that that's never going to be perfection. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Not legalistic, just realistic. 
if I'm if I'm committed to this and I want to do this to the best of my ability, this is what it takes. And admitting that and creating rhythms that are in line with that is what you have to do. Absolutely. Well, and 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 if I can be honest, recognizing I really like God and I want to spend time with him regardless of the distractions. And frankly, I like myself more when I regularly spend time with God. Yeah. I am a more pleasant, relaxed, healthy person when I am staying connected with God. It's a relationship that is genuinely important for me. Yeah. So in terms of developing rhythm, we have talked about when to pray. And not in a prescriptive sort of way, but in a just realistic sort of way. But I want to also talk about where to pray, because you mentioned already, just in in vague terms, getting to the spot where you're going to pray. And it sounds like you've carved out that spot. Where do you pray and why do you pray there? Well, that's great. So I am in the middle of changing this. Because we changed some things around in my house. But uh, so we have a spare room in my house that has this wonderful, round, oscillating chair. It is one of the most cool, comfortable chairs I've ever seen. And I love the fact that we have it. It's almost the only thing in that spare room because. We don't have an extra bed. So when people come and visit us, we move our bed into the spare room and we inflate an air mattress for ourselves. And so that's what, what they get. That is yep. so not what you did for us. We slept on the air mattress. Okay. We didn't um, get the I'm good sorry. treatment. Yes, that's true. When the, the most recent other guests that we've had have been both sets of our parents. When... We have guests that are senior to us. Yes. Uh, When when they're flying the preferred, you know, when they pay for the preferred package, um, (laughs) uh, they they get the good treatment. Schmucks like you, we just get the air mattress to. (laughs) I guess. Yeah, that's true. Uh, But, um, but yeah, so the only thing in there is that round chair and... Oddly, the one thing I have found that I need to be able to do, I need to be able to sit wherever I sit with my legs crossed, like what my kids call crisscross applesauce. I don't have any spiritual reason for that. It just helps me connect because that's the way I've done it for a really long time. Hmm. And that chair lets me do that. And the view out the window is lovely. And so... And it is the only thing I do in that room. I think mm-hmm. that's important for me. I don't do church work. I don't do personal work. I'm not recording a podcast in that room. I'm doing nothing else in that room. I literally never walk in. And so I can pause for a moment almost at the threshold of the room and say, all right, this is my time with God. What about for you? Do you have a specific spot well, I I do, but it is quite opposite in nature, I suppose. I have a recliner in the corner of our living room where I do just about everything. I've been doing my MDiv online, and so it is I'm almost always in front of my laptop or in front of a book. And or so, both. Uh, yes, yes or both. And so no need for a false dichotomy. <laughs> I do I do that largely in this recliner. And so I just live in this recliner. We talked a while back about the rhythms that my dogs expect and know about. They see me heading to the recliner with a blanket and they're like, "Oh, it's time. He's going to be there a while. We're going to get to join him." So I so I I tend to pray there, but I like to uh spin it around and face the outside and look out over the meadow out back. And that is more prayerful and contemplative for me. So I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. But, you know, we talked in the previous episode about getting closer to the target 
And Mm -hmm. the absolute bullseye for me is hiking in the woods and praying, praying and singing and reading the Psalms when I am alone in the woods. I have bellowed out some, I don't know, I think amazing hymns (laughs) in front of waterfalls and things. I, only to discover like 10 minutes later that there are some people that like join me at the waterfall. And I'm like, how loud was I just now? But I really appreciate being in the woods and theoretically being alone and connecting with God, whether that's sitting in uh, on a mountaintop and, and, and reading my Bible and just enveloped in the Psalms in, in a way that I can really only get when I'm sitting at the edge of a mountain. Uh, something about the Psalms comes alive for me there and praying mm. out loud or in my head as I hike and singing as those prayers morph into song and I just have to sing. That's the center of the bullseye for me. There is nothing more meaningfully meaningful for me spiritually than those moments in the woods with God. And I, I can't get that every day. But if we talk about rhythms, there's rhythms that we do daily, and then there are kind of annual or quarterly rhythms that need to be built into life. And if I'm honest, I need more time in the woods alone with God, because that's the center of the bullseye for me. Yeah, no, it's funny that you mentioned that, because when I heard you talk about rhythms last time we were talking, this is the very issue that came to mind for me. Over the last couple of maybe 10, 8, 10 years, more years than not, I have found a moment where I could take a personal retreat, typically something that involves two nights so that there's a full day in the middle where I'm not coming or going and I can just shut off all the distractions and I can really re-engage with God. And what I do on those is very different every single time. But the thing that I I have found is that when I spend those large chunks of time with God, in whatever way that means, I might be reading a book, I might be journaling, I might be hiking, I might be running, I might be at a an art gallery, I might be watching sermon videos, I might, I might be dozens of different things. But whatever it is, setting that time aside for something that is relationally meaningful, that is beyond what I can get in the day-to-day, doesn't just help me take a step closer to God. It actually enriches the the day-to-day moments I do spend with God. Oh, yeah, it so does. You're right. You know, I just came back recently from a vacation and— our kids are old enough now that they could spend the first couple hours of the day doing whatever they were going to do, and I don't need to supervise them. They could go fishing, or they could go for a walk, or whatever they were going to do. And that gave me space on this vacation to just really intentionally spend some extra time with God. Not hours every day, just a little bit of extra time. And the other thing is that it helped me unwind. And I am very confident I connect with God better when I am not all wound up. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> it totally, totally makes sense. And, you know, added to this, it's not, sometimes the place matters. And the Absolutely. reason I say that uh, in particular is there are certain places that means something to my spiritual journey, that when I step into those spaces, I remember what God did in my heart and in my life in that space. So recently when we, well, I don't know about recently, I guess it was last year, when we came out to Missouri and met you there and we got a chance to tour the school where we went to college and we got to sit in some of the chapels that we sat in and we did some long prayer times in those chapels, Mm. I was able to revisit 
those moments with God that I had experienced in those moments. So those were huge for me. But then there's also my childhood camp that I grew up going to, my Christian camp, uh, Camp Arowana. It is out in Welch's, Oregon, which sits at the base of Mount Hood, really not too far from some of the prime skiing on Mount Hood. It has this amazing old growth forest at the base of the mountain. And there's a river, the Sandy River that runs through, or the Salmon River or Sandy River. I actually don't remember. I think it's the Salmon, actually. Salmon River that runs through the camp. And there's just some beautiful spaces out there that were very formative to me in my Christian walk. And I know this last New Year's Eve, we rented a house that was not too far from Camp Arowana. We rented a house with some family and we did some hiking in the woods. It was snowy and really beautiful out and it was a fun hike. But it was even more than that. It was, for me, in my spiritual imagination, God lives in those woods. And when I'm Mm. in those woods, I am in the presence of God. So those spaces in particular, I think, are also important to build into our rhythms to remember the places where God has met us. You know, I mean, this is all through Scripture, right? You know, they cross the river and God says, get a bunch of stones and build a tower right here so that everybody remembers what I did here. Oh, yeah. You know, I think we as Christians need to be building those kind of moments into our lives where we're reminded and we're reminding others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was neat to be in those woods with my family and to be able to tell my kids, I can't really describe this, but because Camp Arowana was so formative for me, and now that I'm in these woods, I mean, God lives here. It just sharing kind of a piece of my heritage with them. You're right. You pass that from generation to generation. Yeah, it's huge. You know, and if if I can flip this coin over, one of the things that's been interesting for me, we're talking about kind of macro rhythms. One of the things I realize that I'm kind of right in the middle of right now is recognizing the importance of sort of micro rhythms. Uh, What I mean is, in the middle of the day, I need to constantly find ways to bring myself back to God throughout the day. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, surely, if anybody can understand this, you can. Your work requires every drop of your attention. And the price of failure is really high. Mm-hmm. I would Im- imagine you can go for a chunk of time without thinking about how awesome Jesus is. <laughs> right, right. You, you know, like I'm, I'm assuming that makes sense. And you said this before that you take your break and use that break time to pray through the daily office. And I have recently just really been finding how important it is for me to pause what I'm doing in order to come back to God, whether that is using, again, the first couple of minutes of my lunch time to pray, whether that is pausing between tasks. Honestly, I have not mastered this. I am a million miles from having mastered this. But boy, when I string together moments with God throughout my work day, it almost inevitably was a better work day. And yet, it is very hard for me to do this well. Yes. And the contrast between spending time with God versus the activity of the day, for me, is very profound. Yeah. You mentioned the the amount of concentration that my work requires. The corollary to that is the amount of noise inherent in my job. In my role as a supervisor, we have all of the radio channels turned up and we're listening to them simultaneously. And so 
I have that input, plus I'm in the same room where all the call taking and the dispatching is taking place. So there's a lot of ambient noise. There's a lot of noise coming from the speakers right in front of me. And there are there's noise in the conversations that I'm having with other people. It is just noise all the time. And so when I mm. intentionally break away from that and cultivate a time of prayer, the profound silence in centering my heart before God is so markedly different from my busy day that I find myself really wanting to cultivate silence. And going back to the last episode, I kind of left it on a cliffhanger with this this Hollow app. And I really like the fact that this author, the way that they put it together, will read a portion of the gospel and then leave this long silence for you to contemplate it and then read it again and then another profound silence and then read it again. That is not just inviting you to reflect on the gospel. It is teaching you how to engage in silence. And I need that. Mm -hmm. I feel like that training that is inherent within that app is exactly what I want. And I'm going to be using that Hello app just for that because I want to grow in my silence, if that makes sense. Yeah, hundred percent it does. And and the thing I appreciate about the Hello app and that particular piece of it is that you can set it so that the whole experience takes anything from five minutes to thirty minutes, depending on what you've got. Oh wow. So it's not like it has to take twelve minutes or it has to take twenty minutes or it it's you can't choose twenty eight minutes, but you can choose I think it's five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and thirty. That way you know, if, if I've got 10 minutes between two meetings, 10 minutes feels a little short to do it for me. That's, you know, maybe that's because I've done it a bunch of times or whatever, but, but yeah, you can kind of tailor it a little bit, which is awesome that they think about that kind of thing. Uh, that's fantastic. Yes. I'm so excited. Both the last episode and this episode makes me want to spend time with God more. It makes me want to, to deepen these practices, try on new practices I'm motivated and inspired to keep growing in this area because of these conversations. Yes. Which we may have to have a third one of these, but we are coming close to running out of time here, and I don't want to miss out on anything else you may be thinking about. Uh, so are there other things you've been thinking about? Honestly, what I have been thinking about ties directly to this. This whole conversation has been very now for me. This is very much where I am currently. But the corollary to that is a book that I just finished reading, which was A Burning in My Bones. It's the authorized biography of Eugene Peterson. And if you've read mm -hmm. The Pastor, the first half of the book is largely repetition from that. And I was a little disappointed initially, and I thought I was going to really hate this book because I'd already heard it. But the second half of the book is phenomenal and it's all new content. And it really dove into Eugene Peterson's motivations. It really dove into a lot of his journal entries and the overriding desire of Eugene Peterson's heart. I want to say this correctly and I don't want it to be misconstrued. The overarching desire of his heart was to become a saint not in terms of being glorified by others as a saint or any of the bad connotations you might attach to that, but genuinely being transformed by God's holiness such that he is a living saint. That is what he wanted. And so he developed all of his rhythms and his time with God and his prayer life around this desire to be a saint. And there's lots of journal entries that are highlighted in the book that say, okay, well, if my desire is to be a saint, then I need to be doing these things, or I need to be cutting out these things. Or just to open reflection, does this behavior that I'm, I've adopted, does it fit with my desire to be a saint or not? And so his whole mindset was centered around this. And for me, 
I was inspired by that. I want to want to be a saint, if that makes sense. Like I, he wanted mm. to be a saint and had a real clear conception of that. I am inspired by his desire and I want what he wanted. And I feel like I'm one step removed from it and would like to grow into that. Yeah. Yeah. Please inspire me more. That's what you're saying to him. Yes. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So what about you? What are you thinking? You know, my thought also is very connected to our conversation and, and, really the practice of that as I look at my daily life. As I look at my work life, I sit at a computer a large chunk of the day and am doing various projects and writing things and emails and whatever I'm doing. Often I'm doing a multitude of briefer tasks. And I find myself... I have always found myself very good at doing 50 to 55 minutes worth of work and like I can get a lot done, but I need to like pause for a couple minutes and regroup before I dive back in. It's sort of the, you know, coming back to the idea of rhythm, I find myself, whatever the project is, like I can dive in, but then I need to kind of come back up for air for a couple of minutes and then dive back into working and then come back up for air and especially with lots of little things, I often find myself sort of keyed up trying to accomplish as many things as possible. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. Then I'm going to get this done. Then I'm going to get this done. And it's, it's kind of keyed up is really the best phrase for it. Yet the ways I've often taken a breath in the middle of that in my work rhythms have often been ways that further key me up. Mm. Uh, watching a three-minute YouTube video or scrolling through Facebook, or whatever, are definitely not things that tone me down. They're things that key me up more. And I just had this thought today as I was walking through my day, if every time I wanted to pause like that and just take a breath, whether it was for 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes or whatever, if that somehow was decompressing time that I was intentionally prayerful about in the broadest sense, what would that look like? So today I grabbed a copy of the book of Psalms and read a couple of verses from Psalms periodically throughout whenever I kind of needed to take a break. Mm. And it could look a million different ways. But man, I tell you what, taking those couple minutes to decompress and reconnect with God unsurprisingly had a very positive effect on my day. <laughs> ah, that's so good. I think that just captures exactly what we've been talking about in this episode and the way these, these rhythms transform us, uh, especially as we engage in them mm. over time. So I want to again, turn to the audience and I cautioned last episode that maybe you don't want to weigh in yet. But as you've seen on social media, we've kind of split this up. Uh, episode A is a much more about the methods of Bible study. And this episode here has been much more about the rhythms of uh, your Bible study. So I want to know what rhythms are you engaging in? What rhythms have been helpful to you? And how have you dealt with some of the obstacles that prevent those rhythms? We really want to hear from you. Let's make this a community effort so that we can build one another up. I really want us to succeed in this area really bad. Yeah, you know, even as you were talking about wanting to be inspired, uh, you know, when you were saying that about the Eugene Peterson book, I was thinking, man, I can't wait to see some of the things that people say work for them and what they're learning and how they're growing, because I look forward to being inspired by what people say about how they're growing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so I also want to uh, come back to this last week, we posted a Witch Josh question, and it was Witch Josh uh, rode in a hot air balloon on his first anniversary, and uh, that was me. 
we had agreed, uh, my wife and I, to do first anniversary presents that didn't cost anything. And yet my wife had always said she wanted to go on a hot air balloon. It was like one of her things. And so I made her, out of construction paper and tin foil, a little <laughs> card, which didn't cost me anything. And I gave it to her on our anniversary that said, I'm taking you on a hot air balloon. <laughs> you cheater. So I, I will say that may be the only time I have ever done well on a birthday or anniversary because I don't do awesome at those sorts of things. Oh, man. But I'm still pretty proud of that one. Yeah, A+. plus. I also fail in this area pretty bad. And I think Shelly's been very gracious to me, but man, I I really need to do better in this area. So I'm thank you for doing well and telling us about it. <laughs> You're welcome. It was the one story like that that I could possibly have. <laughs> um. Uh, well, this has been awesome. As always, everybody out there, please weigh in on Reddit. We can't wait to hear from you. Let's be inspired. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to next week. All right. Well, then I'll talk to you then, okay? All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.